At this time, Lauren's going to come forward this morning and read this morning's scripture lesson. Good morning. We're going to be reading Mark 2, 1 through 12. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing, him, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them, since they could not get in the get into sorry since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and after digging through it lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on when Jesus saw their faith he said to the paralytic son your sins are forgiven now some teachers of the law of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who, who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to a paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? But that but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I'll tell you, you get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out, full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. And that is the end of God's work. Thank you, Lord. Can we be in an attitude of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just use me as your vessel up here this morning. Speak to all of us here. Help us to hear the word that you want us to hear. And I pray that we would take that word, we would go home, meditate on it, and that we would go out and then live it so that people can truly see the light of you, Jesus, in this world. This I pray in your heavenly name. Amen. <clears throat> now, many of you may have heard this morning's scripture reading, thinking to yourself, see, at Christmas, why are we talking about the paralytic man exactly? Shouldn't we be talking about the manger some more? I guess, yeah, to a certain extent we should. However, I can't think of what is to come. It's a little under seven days until we find ourselves in a new year. This brings excitement for a lot of people as they set goals and they want to accomplish, that they want to accomplish in the year 2022. As a new year brings new start for a lot of people. However, with a new year comes a lot of unknowns. Will 2022 be better than 2021? Will we continue to deal with the coronavirus? Will the world continue to get worse as our country continues to divide? What will happen? What will happen here at Jacob's Church? as we continue to look for a pastor. These are all questions we have for the future. Now, if we were to focus in on these questions about the unknown, some of them we probably would get overwhelmed with to the point that we become full of fear, a fear that would not allow us to move, a fear that would suffocate us. However, when we focus on Jesus, we can overcome any obstacle that comes our way. So this morning, I want us to focus in on a story from the book of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, which Lauren read for us. 
of a group of friends who kept their faith, their focus on Jesus and overcame the obstacles set in front of them. It was fall. Jesus had just arrived or returned to Capernaum after several days of seclusion. He had to stay in secluded areas because his popularity grew after he healed a leper several days earlier in Capernaum. Jesus just set foot in town when word began to spread that Jesus was back. Soon the house that Jesus was staying in became so packed with visitors that there was no room. The house was so full that people began to erupt from the house out the door and on to the streets. Suddenly, four men arrived on the scene with their friend who had palsy. Wherever these men came from, which it doesn't say, they carried their friend to where Jesus was staying on a wooden pallet. I would assume that these men heard about Jesus being in town through the grapevine, just like everyone else. So I would assume that they expected a crowd of people. However, I'm not sure if they were prepared for how crowded it really was going to be. How many of you have ever been to New York City before? Raise your hands. I wouldn't advise you to go now, but... <laughs> but how many of you have ever rode on a subway car? <laughs> okay? How many of you have ridden on a sub car during rush hour? Raise your hand. Yeah. And you know how crowded that gets, don't you? Yeah. I remember my first time when I lived in New York, and I remember going down to the subway station. I don't remember exactly where I was coming from, but I was going back home. And it was around 5 o'clock, and I was going down, I think it was the A train, which goes uptown in Times Square. And so I was going down to the A train, and I was going to hop onto the A train, and when I started going down the steps, I basically came into a flood of people standing on the platform waiting to go home from work that day. And I needed to get home, so I started to push my way through to the edge of the platform. And the train pulled up, and this train was already full of people from the stop before, but I still needed to get home. So I shoved my way into the train car along with everybody else that legs and feet were poking out the side of the car and people were still pushing in, and people were trying to get out, and it's like, if you didn't get out, too bad. You missed your stop. You're just going to have to get off at the next one and come back. But people were still shoving into the point. People were pushing other people in, trying to close the doors so that the car could go on. Imagine that's probably how crowded, crowded the house was at the time. Now, at that time, it wasn't too bad with crowd, but if I would do that now, I would have turned around and went home. Or I don't even know how I would have gone home. I probably would have walked how many blocks to my house where I was staying. But since it was so crowded, these men cannot maneuver their paralyzed friend into the house to see Jesus. It doesn't say that these men stopped to think about their options after seeing the crowd. So I believe that their faith in Jesus was so strong but there was no turning back. There was no plan B. They wanted to see their friend healed. And they knew that Jesus was the only one that could get that job done. How many of you have a crazy friend? <laughs> Let me explain a little more. How many of you have a crazy friend that comes up with really wild ideas that are off the wall? Raise your hand. If you're not raising your hand, perhaps you are that crazy friend. <laughs> I believe that when this crazy friend was standing there with the rest of the friends, he came up with this brilliant idea. Hey, guys, let's go in through the roof. The other two were standing there like, 
Not him again. This is ridiculous. Come on, we can't do that. However, it was always, there's always one friend that's like the level-headed friend that's kind of the leader of the pack, and whatever he said went. And that one guy in that group, he said, you know what? That's not a bad idea. He then goes on to explain that during the fall season, these roofs are as, at their weakest, that they could carry the friend up the steps to the top of this small house and lower the friend down on his pallet to where Jesus is. I believe that after he spoke, that they all looked at each other and were like, you know what? Let's do it. Let's do it. There was no second guessing. There was no giving up or turning back. No, they dug the hole in the roof and lowered their friend right in front of Jesus. Now, when Jesus saw this all unfolding in front of his eyes, he could have gotten upset. I mean, this wasn't his house that he was staying at. This was his friend Peter's. So somebody's coming along, digging a hole in your friend's roof to see you. <laughs> I mean, I probably would get upset. Tell that person, you got to leave. You can't be doing that kind of stuff here. But not Jesus. No. For these men to come along and wreck something that belongs to people, <laughs> this made Jesus see how much faith that these men truly had. He recognized how strong their faith was in him. Not only did they go to such lengths to get to him by overcoming obstacles such as being paralyzed, carrying the friend on the pallet to where Jesus was, and overcoming the crowd, he also recognized that these men, they trusted him. They knew that the minute they got that paralyzed man in front of Jesus, he would be healed. And they were right. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. I believe that as Jesus was saying those words, the two, the man and Jesus, were making eye contact. And it was like nobody else existed in the room whatsoever. That man felt something that nobody else knew what was happening inside of him at the time. I don't know how many of you know this about me. It's pretty well known by now. But I went to school to become an actor. In 2008, I began my journey to becoming an actor by attending Kutztown University. However, during my first year as a freshman, I met an obstacle in the form of my advisor. He told me that I was never going to make it as an actor, that I wasn't good enough to be one. Now, advisors are supposed to be there to help students. And maybe he was through reverse psychology. I'm not sure. However, at the time, I felt ridiculed and attacked. I felt like my advisor was an obstacle, and I needed to prove to him that I belonged here. Fast forward to my junior year. The theater program put on a production of different monologues throughout the night. After I performed mine, the same advisor came up to me and told me, you did a fantastic job. I overcame the obstacle by pushing toward the goal which was to prove my advisor wrong, that I did belong. Jesus was going through the similar thing after telling the paralyzed man he was forgiven. He had to prove who he was to the religious leaders. These teachers of religious law, according to Mark chapter 2, verse 6, were sitting there thinking to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. 
They weren't wrong. These guys remind me of two characters from The Muppet Show, Statler and Waldorf. How many of you know who the, that, those two guys are? Yeah. They were just sitting in the background, criticizing in their minds what Jesus said. Finally, Jesus had enough and called them out on it. He said, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick, your, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. In this moment, Jesus is proving to everybody in that room just who he is. He is the Son of Man, the man that can identify with our deepest needs and our sufferings and help us overcome sin. The way he helps us overcome sin is by taking our heavy burdens, and he takes them upon himself. He then took them to the cross, where they were defeated, not because he had to, but because he wanted to. Jesus is also proving to everyone that he is the Son of God, the one that everyone has been waiting for. He then turns back to that paralyzed man and says, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Again, I can only imagine this paralyzed man because all this time, he felt this inner change happened within him. He felt the muscles start to breathe and come back to life. He felt the ligaments move, ligaments that haven't moved probably for a long time, if ever. The man stood up on his feet, grabbed his mat, walked out through the crowd, I believe he never once stopped looking at Jesus. After that man left, I believed everyone was shocked and astounded by this, that it was so quiet that you could hear a pin drop. This man was showing Jesus that he not only trusted him, but he was obedient to him as well. I believe after the man walked out of the room, it exploded with noise of praise and joy, proving once and for all that when we focus on Jesus, we can come overcome any obstacle. Now you may be sitting here this morning asking the question, how can you say that? How can you say that when you have no clue what I have been through? You're right. I don't know what each and every one of us has been through. I don't know the skeletons that are in our closets. However, we can learn, excuse me, a very important lesson from this paralyzed man. You will be surprised, just like the paralyzed man, what you can overcome when you focus on Jesus. So as we head into this new year, let's not put our faith on what we can see. Instead, let's put our focus on Jesus, who not only set this man, but all of us free. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for what you have shown us through this story how much, how important faith really is, especially when we're faced with obstacles in our lives. And we don't know what obstacles are going to, we're going to face in the next year or the years to come. And they're going to challenge us. Some of them are going to hurt. Some are going to make us feel like there's no point to continue on. 
however, there is a very important point. There's a very important piece, and that's you. We have hope and joy because of you, Lord. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the blessings that you show us each and every day. We thank you for the sacrifice you made for us on the cross. So help us to focus on you as we continue to live our lives here on earth. Not only continue to grow in our faith, but to continue to grow and impact the lives of, of others around us. This we pray in your heavenly name, Lord. Amen.